I am a painting conservator. Some of you may have seen me hanging around out here. I'm a frustrated artist and admiring what you guys do and uh, took a different turn a long time ago. But in any case, uh, since the early 90s, I've been restoring paintings uh, full time and um, uh, uh, I've come tonight to just talk to you about my work and work of painting conservators in general uh, and how we approach it today as opposed to in past centuries. So um, uh, let's get started. Um, in the early days of restoration, um, there's a distinction between the word restoration and conservation. We tend to use the word conservators, like as Colleen just said. Uh, restoration has come to have a bad name. Uh, the the uh, uh, restorers in days of old would often fix paintings with the materials of the artist, and uh, as as I will show later, um, that's quite a no-no. You can you can do a lot of damage to an artwork by fixing it with uh, oil oil paint. Uh, it's counterintuitive, but I'll explain why. Uh, and, if, and if some of you came to my, uh, my talk here last year about uh, the optical properties of oil, we covered some of the, the, the chemical transitions that oil paint makes that, that, that are the cause for, for, for that, why we don't restore in the same medium that, that uh, the pictures were uh, created in. But um, so the preferred term nowadays is conservation, and you think about what that suggests. You want to conserve what's there, what has happened through its long journey through time. You want to preserve and save uh, from further de deterioration. Uh, the old restorers, the, uh, the emphasis on that word, the suggestion is to fix it and make it like it left the artist's easel, make it new again. Um, and while that is an aspect of what we do, it's not the emphasis today. Uh, many museum people are horrified by the word restoration because a lot of damage has been done over the, over the centuries with, with that idea. Uh, so we're, we're, we're called conservators. Um, uh, how many of you have read a little bit of uh, history, like Cennino Cennini, the, the, early, the Craftsman's Handbook? Libro dell'arte, yeah, yeah. It's fascinating reading, yeah? Uh, I think he makes mention of um, uh, uh, certain recipes for varnishes and acknowledges that um, paintings do darken. It was known in the earliest days, and uh, he's 1400, they think, roughly, when that book was written. Um, uh, 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 and by the way, if you haven't read it, it's fascinating. There's, 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 just tidbits, the, the translation, the Dover translation is like 10, 15 bucks. It's, uh, and it might even be free online, I don't know. Um, if, if some of you attended uh, Ramon's lecture last week uh, or watched it on YouTube, he, he gave away the, the, the big secret is that many of these books, so many of them are available on archive.org uh, and you could just have a, a field day reading these old old uh, manuscript uh, books, articles, manuscripts. They're in the public domain. So in any case, Cennino Cennini makes reference to the deterioration of paintings. It was known that the materials they were using would darken, that would undergo changes, would need re-varnishing, um, um, and no doubt, even back then, <clears throat> restorers were fixing paintings, were doing general upkeep, adding coats of varnish. Um, uh, the Sistine ceiling is a, a, a very obvious example. I'm not talking about the, the big restoration in the, what was that, the 90s, I think. Um, but uh, some of its earliest, uh, the earliest interventions were to take care of damage that occurred quite naturally from smoke coming up and coating the frescoes. Um, the, uh, the, as, as uh, you're all working so hard on your, your uh, value structures in your drawings, your, your value scales, you can imagine over time if smoke lays a veil over these beautiful colorful images, the, the value range will be very compressed and What's the solution? Well, get up there and darken the darks. And so, so before you know it, you get a, a, a vicious cycle of rest, uh, restoration, but not really restoration. You're adding to it, you're, you're adding uh, other people's work, you're, you're changing it, you're not addressing the actual problem. So um, uh, The Last Supper is another example of, 
uh, an area where well-meaning restorers, quote unquote restorers, would do damage. I believe the fellow that restored that in uh, uh, 1726 uh, mistook it for a fresco and approached it as if he's cleaning something, you know, where the colors are embedded in the, the, the lime. Uh, in fact, it was <clears throat> not quite a fresco, and uh, he did quite a bit of damage from harsh cleanings, and that's, that's gonna be a theme throughout, uh, well, it's been a theme throughout my whole career. 90% of the pictures we work on, if not more, have some form of uh, misguided attempts at repair in their, in their past, and we, part of what we do, a big part of what we do is trying to undo that and redo it in a better, more precise way. In any case, uh, The Last Supper is a, is a, a, a wreck, you know, uh, a wreck of its original idea because of these well-meaning but misguided attempts at restoration. Um, the, uh, 1734, I think, was the big fire in the Spanish court where 500 paintings were lost. Um, uh, Velasquez, Titian, Rubens, and enough to fill a major museum several times over were completely burned in this fire. After which the, the paintings that survived were restored as a collection. It's the first time a collection was restored en masse um, by uh, um, Juan Garcia de Miranda. His work, if you look it up, is, is very unexceptional, and I, I can only imagine that <clears throat> part of his restorations were overpaints um, and adding parts to canvases. I think there's a Velasquez where the top edge is added. Uh, I'm sure he didn't work alone. He had teams of people, um, but this was what passed for restoration back in, in the olden days uh, and doesn't anymore. Um, it became a, an, uh, a profession, regularized profession, in the 18th century where there were picture restorers, but there were often failed painters, people familiar with the artist materials who would be called upon to, to fix, fix the pictures, but again, without a full understanding of uh, or respect for the original artwork. Um, uh, there's references in the literature to cleaning materials. You've probably heard all this onions, uh, uh, urine, uh, uh, rancid wine, vinegar uh, uh, as cleaning agents. Um, oh, sorry? We still use that. Yeah. Yes, it's very good, very good. That one's good. <laughs> In fact, I did a, um, um, I worked for a summer up at the uh, Center for um, uh, Technical Studies at, at Harvard at the Fog. Um, and uh, they had me clean a whole, uh, what was it, Romney or something with spit. Um, but of course you wash it off at the end, but the, the enzymes in human saliva are very good for dislodging a lot of surface dirt. Uh, so, um, and there was a fellow at the time who was even trying to uh, make a chemical version to, uh, you know, with the right enzymes, and it's, it's a legit cleaner. <laughs> So, um, uh, but uh, onions and urine, that's, that's where, that's the, that's the bad side of the tracks. Um, in any case, uh, and, and the idea of washing or neutralizing your cleaner uh, afterwards probably wasn't uh, uh, around. And those, those things, even saliva could end up, you know, affecting the painting if it's not you know, after it's done its work, not, not cleaned or neutralized. Um, hot irons were also used for lining paintings uh, with a paste on the back, um, or relining it sometimes called, uh, which we'll get into in a little bit. But uh, uh, when a canvas is laid because of structural reasons to another canvas, um, uh, it would, the glue would be set with very hot irons and that would uh, uh, crush an impasto, as you can imagine. And, if it wasn't properly cleaned beforehand, the dirt itself would be um, uh, kind of baked into this now smashed impasto. Uh, and that's, that's uh, unfortunately, there's nothing you can do about that. My first introduction to that was that I, I, I went to a, a college for art history, and in the gallery was a Turner 
Um, and I was talking to the museum director there and he explained to me why the impasto on this turner was flattened and gray. And yeah, they used to use hot irons to, to, to line pictures. So that's unfortunately something we can't do anything about. Um, and, and the last thing I have up there is a sort of a, one of these sort of bad habits that carried into the new profession of Restoro is using oil. Um, and I'll explain quickly why that's a no-no, um, which you can probably guess. If a painting has mellowed, has darkened, as oil darkens when it ages, after about 50, 100 years of existence, and then somebody retouches a loss with oil, it might look great when it leaves their studio, but it hasn't yet darkened, the retouch, that is. Um, it will later darken, and then their retouches, which looked so good at the time, <clears throat> now stand out like a sore thumb. Uh, furthermore, oil polymerizes, and I talked about this last year, my, my, my presentation. It polymerizes and cross-links. It becomes very tough, which is a good quality. That's why our paintings are very sturdy after they age. It's why restorers can then clean with harsh solvents because it can't affect that very strong oil bond. However, when that retouching that was put on in good faith in oil goes south and goes dark, and needs to be removed, they then have to use harsher and harsher solvents to get rid of it. And then talk about a vicious cycle, you create this vicious cycle of uh, cleaning paintings with harsh solvents, you might lose upper glazes, you, you'll, it, you're creating this sort of merry-go-round of uh, <laughs> incremental destruction if, if that's what you do. So uh, it occurred to people, okay, maybe we should restore with something else that doesn't discolor uh, or holds its tone. So um, I'll go on to, uh, uh, yes, oh, I'm gonna t show you a big, uh, uh, big disclaimer. I'm gonna show you some techniques tonight um, and you're all familiar with art materials, but don't try it. Um, it's, uh, I, I'll make the, the brief point that it, while there's science involved, um, a lot of the hardcore science throws me, uh, and there are plenty of people who, who just do materials research and inform the field, but it is truly an art conservation. Um, and it pulls from a lot of different disciplines, but uh, without a lot of experience, you can really do damage. In fact, what I have up on there is, um, did you all know that the Windsor Newton sells picture cleaner? They've, yeah. <laughs> My very first freelance job was from a fellow in Boston who uh, had a turn of the 20th century, about 1900, copy of a Titian, Titian's Flora, that he tried to clean himself with that very product. He left it on too long. The active ingredient in it is, an ammo is ammonia. There's also balsams and stuff. And in any case, it ate right through the paint layer, and then he so it wasn't so much a restoration project as a repainting project, which I was happy to do. It's fun, but, uh, but um, that stuff can eat right through a painting. And they sell it, you know, and they shouldn't. And at Windsor Newton, unfortunately, uh, it's, it's, a, it's shameful how they, they've, they've traded on their good name for so long, but it's, uh, it's, they shouldn't sell the stuff. And other companies have followed suit. Even um, George from Natural Products has, uh, Natural Pigments, um, has a line of conservation products. I trust his products, but I don't love the idea that he's just selling them. It's really an apprentice type position. Uh, my first, um, as I was getting into it, I was apprenticing with a fellow downtown, a commercial restorer, who did, tell me once, uh, I asked him a question about uh, uh, chemicals, certain chemicals to clean a certain picture, and he said, well, when you've cleaned a couple of thousand paintings, you'll know. It wasn't a very good answer in time, but he was right. Now that I've done that, you begin to get a feel for what varnishes, how they behave, how certain chemicals affect them, uh, and um, uh, um, yeah, there's no substitute for experience. Um, and also, luckily, in the commercial world in New York, you get a lot of experience with the auction houses, with galleries. There's just a lot of work here, and uh, dealers that um, that need your services. 
Um, the irony is sometimes if you get your master's, which I don't have, but if you, if you want to work for a museum, you'll have to get the upper level degrees. Uh, you will work very on very many fewer pictures and your skill level may not be so good. Um, but um, there's, a, there's a lot of prestige attached to that. I prefer it in the hurly-burly world of New York where we're constantly challenged by, by different projects and um, you can't help but get better by just doing it a lot. And you all know from, from just doing what you do here, there's just no substitute for time in the studio. So that's true of us too. Okay, well-meaning but. Now that's, that poor woman is a laugh line everywhere and I don't mean to do that. Um, uh, however, uh, I'm actually gonna show something a little bit more specific. You see, the rare, you always see the, uh, the, the punch line there, but um, the actual original image has actual losses. If she had just confined herself to those losses, she might have not gotten into so much trouble, but she didn't know to do that, and the instinct, and this is a rookie mistake, we've all, all of us who've, who've cut our teeth do it, you try to match that color, and it's almost there, it's a little quite, so you put a little more paint on top, more, more, before you know it, the borders are expanding further and further and further, so much so she's given him a new haircut, and new eyes, there's nothing, there's nothing wrong with those eyes, and yet she, her attempt at smoothing and, and blending led to a complete repainting of the thing. So um, that's the ultimate rookie mistake. I honestly feel badly for that woman because her heart was in the right place, but she did everything wrong. Um, so, uh, so, could, yes? Did she ever like, I don't know. I, I kind of felt so badly for her. I didn't want to dwell on it, and I shouldn't even be dwelling on it now, but I just wanted to show that the, the I've, I've succumbed to this too, when you're really, really trying to stay in the lines, but your color is not quite there, the, the instinct is to add more, and that color needs to go somewhere, and it tends to spread. Um, uh, so w w the way I learned is you don't do that. You do tiny dots, one on top of the other, just with these tiny, tiny brushes. And I brought some of the brushes that I use over there, and you can see they're zeros, ones, and even when they get a little worn, they're even smaller and finer. The Winsor Newton Series 7 watercolor brushes. Um, uh, so that's sort of the technique to not get into that. And, I, and when I was apprenticing, there was a fellow I worked with who was a master retoucher who taught me, uh, this was brilliant advice, if you have to do a small fill like she had in the hair, a lot of small little losses, you don't even have to get the color right. If you get that dot really small and right in the center of the loss, it doesn't even have to be the right color, but people's eyes will fill it in for you. Um, so if you train yourself to do tinier and tinier dots, you won't get into that area where you start spreading out. Um, in any case, today, conservation doesn't have these issues uh, if you follow, we follow certain principles. Uh, limited intervention, obviously, we want to stay right in the damage. Uh, we don't want to line a painting just because it would look better it, you know, only if it's necessary. And Colleen, your paintings, we talked about this, um, they're, they're, they are great candidates for lining because, uh, well, we'll talk about it a little bit more afterwards, but um, one wants to not do an operation or an intervention unless it's absolutely necessary. The, the thinking behind that is a greater respect for the artwork its integrity, its history. We're not gonna touch it. We're not gonna presume that we have all the answers. Um, that's been a problem with these, those previous uh, restorers. Uh, the second principle is everything we use has to be reversible and non-invasive. Shouldn't, we shouldn't do anything that was going to migrate into the canvas or um, uh, uh, that is not able to be removed easily because the idea of the previous restores is this hubris that I'm actually bringing it back. I'm using oil and it's becoming part of it. No, no, no. What I do, it might look great now, but it could go south and I have to accept that fact. Somebody else has to be able to remove it without harsh solvents. We don't want to get on that merry-go-round again. 
And the last principle, uh, stable color fast materials. Well, that's a no-brainer. Obviously, we want something that's not gonna change color um, uh, and go through its change um, after we've applied it. So we want, we want things that are as, as, as solid as possible. So we tend to use light, fast uh, materials. Um, uh, okay, let's continue. So these are the basic steps. If a painting were to come into uh, our studio or we to go see it, uh, a typical painting might go through these, these steps. Examination and proposal. We'll, we'll, we'll examine the thing. We'll just see where it's been, what's happened to it, uh, what it might need. Sometimes when stuff comes into our uh, the studio, oh, I neglected to mention, I work for Simon Parks Art Conservation. We're a very busy commercial studio and, and we see lots of pictures for the auction houses, for dealers, et cetera. We sometimes recommend not to do anything. Uh, that's a perfectly valid uh, proposal. Um, uh, I can't help this in the way you want me to it. Sometimes they confer these magic powers on us, people who should know better, people in the art business, uh, that we're going to make it into a something or other, but they can't identify what's wrong with it. Well, there's only certain things we can help and stay within those parameters. So um, uh, uh, we'll, we'll make a plan for the picture. Uh, if there is something, we can do it. The next thing is testing. We gotta do a few tests to see if, it's, if there's a cleaning in it. Uh, sometimes there's not. I've been doing this every day uh, since the early 90s, and I'm still surprised at times when there are um, uh, uh, varnishes that don't respond to the solvents as I think they will, um, or it's too dangerous then to pull them off because we'd need harsher solvents, and this comes from a period where they might have done glazes that are susceptible to that. So we have to do these small Q-tip tests in order to uh, uh, assess um, what, what's possible. Then when the work begins, we generally start with structural work. Um, anything having to do with the canvas, the panel. Uh, uh, you don't want to clean something that's not stable, so we want to put that into the shape before we, we go ahead with the work. Um, next would be the cleaning and the isolating varnish, and I put those two things together uh, because uh, the cleaning, well, we've talked a little bit about cleaning, um, but isolating varnish, once the picture is cleaned to the level that we can clean it, we uh, uh, put a, a, a coat of varnish on it to counteract the chalkiness that is this sort of a natural result from uh, solvent clean. Um, you've seen your own paintings sink in in certain areas. Uh, well, when you remove an old varnish with solvents, you see all of that all over again. Um, and uh, it's uh, sometimes when a dealer comes in and looks at a project midway through, we want to put a temporary coat of varnish because some people aren't ready to see their beloved, you know, $100,000 painting looking all, you know, chalky and uh, 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 un unresolved. The varnish instantly counteracts that, or we wet it up with solvent, you know, that will, um, uh, like thinners that will will basically wet it up so they can see it. Uh, but we put an isolating coat on um, also so that we're not retouching on top of the painting. We're retouching on top of this temporary coat of varnish that is easily removable. Again, to be respectful to the thing that our work can be changed if it need be. Uh, then comes the filling and texturing. When there's uh, losses, paint chips, they have to be compensated if, if filled with a, a gesso or a putty, uh, shaped, textured, usually with the blade, sometimes with uh, just the tip of a small tool to create this texture. Um, the, air, the area around it cleaned up and then the retouching starts just in those areas. And then final varnishing, which uh, I will talk about later, but it's usually to knit the whole thing together uh, uh, with, a, with a, a, a one coat of something that will uh, uh, kind of even out the uneven glossiness. Um, so examination, when we're examining it, a uh, big part of that is ultraviolet examination. 
Um, uh, that's the light that we use in our shop, uh, 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 but there's, they come in all different sizes, and um, uh, I've got a couple of portable ones there that I take on site sometimes. Um, and there's even big full bulbs that you can look at large areas with. The ultraviolet will show previous restoration, ideally. It doesn't always, and um, at the risk of getting into the weeds a little bit, there are people that are unscrupulous conservators or restorers that have added UV blocking agents to their varnishes that prevent you, you the possible buyer, from seeing with an ultraviolet the massive tear that's in the middle of this painting. It's and and the real trick is they'll put a little uh, few dots of retouch on top of that to really sell the idea that this this uh, painting from uh, 1680 has only three dots of retouching. It's in miraculous condition. It doesn't happen a lot, but we have encountered that uh, screening varnish. In any case, um, you, you can see from the, uh, the slide on the right, uh, that's the same picture. Uh, the little dots in her brow and her forehead, that's all retouching that ideally you won't see. Uh, that's the same picture, but in, in natural light. Uh, on the left and under UV on the right. The retouches will stand out as darker spots. The newer material will stand out as darker spots. Um, I will say that that's a, people sometimes think the UV is this magic tool that just instantly reveals everything, and it doesn't, especially with later uh, 19th and early 20th century advances in chemistry. New colors have come out that have very wacky <laughs> appearances, fluorescences under the light, and uh, you could misread an actual pigment that the artist used as overpaint. I've seen people do that because they were unfamiliar with how it fluoresces. So you have to be a little bit experienced with that. What's that blue? That's actually the ultra, that's a little bit of, um, it's showing up as a blue thing. It's a little bit of reflection. I think the next slide should be better. That's one in our shop uh, right now. I was actually retouching this this afternoon. Um, the painting on the left has been, the, that band on the left up until the door frame has been cleaned. So you can see it's a bit chalky. Um, under the ultraviolet, just at this stage, you can see it appears black because the resinous varnish, natural resins uh, uh, will, will fluoresce kind of greenish. Do you see on the right? There's a very thick layer of thick resinous varnish. Um, this is where uh, we cleaned it off, and then we proceeded to do the rest of the cleaning um, uh, with uh, with um, uh, uh, to, to remove that to remove that. Um, in any case, because it fluoresces that sort of yellowy green, any retouches on top of that will stand out. Um, but that's, we sometimes use the light as we're cleaning to kind of make sure we got the resin off um, that needed to come off, the discolored varnish. This is a very brown painting, as you can see, so sometimes it's difficult to see, and we don't want to make a confusing picture under the light for some prospective uh, buyer of this picture. Uh, uh, but sometimes you see that. You'll see areas that are reserved that not fully cleaned. Why? Because they were painted in glazes, as a lot of old, older pictures were, and it's just unsafe to do the same cleaning, say, in the shadows of the drapery as it is to do in the sky. That's, uh, do you follow what I'm saying? They will clean it unevenly, and that's under the, under the light. When we see that, we say, aha, there's a restorer who was actually being very sensitive to what's going on with this painting. They backed off from cleaning the resin fully in the brown drapery shadows because that discolored yellow varnish doesn't affect it as much as it does a blue sky. It's a disproportionate uh, 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 effect. Uh, uh, of that discoloration. Um, these are the cleaning. These are cleaning tests. Uh, the one on the left, you can see uh, even the varnish itself has split a bit, um, but a very bright little cleaning test. Generally, small, kind of penny-sized, uh, maybe even smaller um, uh, little holes in the varnish, just to make sure a certain solvent works. 
or, um, or uh, 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 water-based cleaner. Uh, the two pictures on the right, um, you see the cleaning test in his, uh, his uh, uh, shirt there. Um, it's very bright. This was a very discolored painting. Uh, the picture on the far right shows two things. I don't know if this comes through so much, but this is the cleaning test with uh, soaps. So a certain amount of this is discolored um, surface, surface uh, soot. Uh, but then the solvent took off the yellowed varnish. That's the majority of the clean. Um, so you'll want to, on those little cleaning tests, you'll want to start with something weaker, like a soap clean, um, and then proceed to more uh, 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 stronger solvents or cleansers to see what, what, what's the least you can get away with. Um, you don't want to use something too harsh. In fact, if we use acetone or alcohol, we'll often uh, um, mix it so that it's not quite as biting as if it's used full strength. If that works, then why, why endanger the picture that way? Oh, this I just put up. This is the same painting up top. You can see up to where the line is, the, um, uh, that's the soot removal. The varnish has yet to be removed, but you can see the soot tends to gray and darken, flatten out forms, that kind of thing, but that still needs varnish removal. Uh, so when the structural work begins, one of the first things we look for is, is the, is the uh, uh, canvas or panel laying flat. Um, often you'll see buckles in the corners of canvas, they sag. Um, you all know the concept of keys, yeah? I mean, uh, when you go to the art store and buy a stretched canvas, or maybe some of you stretch your own. I don't know if anybody's doing that anymore, but um, uh, do, do put the keys in because they're gonna be needed in the future as the thing goes slack. You see from the picture on the left, those buckles in the corner. Uh, a little gentle tap on those little wooden wedges or keys will open up the corners just enough to, uh, 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 to pull it a little bit taut. With the older pictures, you can only really get away with that if the tacking edge is in good shape, and it's often not. You see, this is a um, deteriorated tacking edge on the left. The, uh, the holes are, um, the, the, the tacks have been removed, but quite often that edge is uh, uh, weakened right at the fold. And so you don't want to key out a picture that, that can't support it, because you're liable to split it right off of the tacking edge. Um, on the right, that's the same canvas, I believe. No, that's a different canvas, um, where an old lining has given out. It was done with hide glue, and um, uh, uh, and it's just weakened over time, probably from moisture or damp, um, and that has to be removed, including the old glue, before it can be relined. I think that's where the phrase came about, relining. What kind of glue did they use? Well, for that one, that's an old glue lining, and I have a slide coming up which uh, the Rijks Museum uh, tested a bunch of paintings to see additives in these traditional glues, and uh, oh gosh, they put sugar, flour. It's basically a hide glue base, um, uh, you know, collagen, uh, uh, but that might be too thin, so they'd bulk it up with things, and there are all these different recipes for, glue, for gluing canvases over the centuries. Um, uh, but that's, and there are still people that do hide, that, that do uh, glue linings. Um, it's, if it's done properly, it can be beautiful. And it's not necessarily done. They even do them on the uh, vacuum hot table, which I'll get to in a minute. Uh, they do them safely now. Uh, but there's other methods that are even safer uh, than these water-based um, uh, glue, glue methods. Um, so you'll want to reinforce the tacking edge. The picture on the left, you'll see at the lower edge, under, when you remove it from the frame quite often, that's where the abrasion happens. Um, and you see that edge is split at the bottom. So you'll want to maybe uh, uh, take it off of the stretcher and put a reinforcing patch or, or strip underneath it. Um, that's what's going on on the right. The strips have been added around the tacking edge and new tacks have been added. Sometimes you can get away with just adding new tacks into an, an unused part of that strip uh, and then you can key it out. Less is more quite often, you know, uh, the, 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 the strip lining is 
uh, not always necessary and not always advisable because you have to remove the whole canvas from the stretcher. Um, it's a bit of a it's a bit of work. Um, then you would work on the surface. We can re-adhere lifting paint uh, locally uh, by putting glues, uh, very thinned out adhesives into the open cracks. Um, uh, in the center you see a series of uh, these, they almost look like wood burning tools. I think they are essentially, but they're with different tips and they're usually used with a, uh, a rheostat to control the temperature. Um, on the right, I don't know if you can see that particular um, uh, uh, shoe that, that is pressing the, um, the paint down with very low heat, whatever whatever whatever's necessary to kind of get it down. It's not touching the paint directly. There is a fine um, film of release, uh, silicone release uh, film between the uh, between the, the heated tip and the paint surface. Uh, personally, when I do this, I like to put even more of a buffer. I'll put the release paper and and a paper towel or two, something to kind of uh, um, protect that paint surface from that metal that's pressing on it. Even gently and even with a low heat, it's still a little bit risky. It can cause a, a, a bit of a, a glossy patch. Um, this is kind of a, a, a sexy modern way of doing it. On the left, a patches, as you can imagine, pretty traditional. Uh, the patch on the right that you see doesn't have the edges feathered, but quite often you'll see fibers pulled out, so it sort of thins the patch at the edge. A big problem with patches is if they're overdone, if they're too heavy or the, the adhesive is too strong, you'll see them on the surface of the painting on the first humid day because the paint, the canvas will change a little bit and you'll see a mirror of the patch on the front. That's a no-no. So there's an art to getting away with as little support as you can and that's where the, this technique on the left is, um, where the, the in either case, whether it's a patch or a bonding, you have to tease the fibers together, and then um, it, it can be very tedious. Uh, just put them in alignment, uh, get, as, get a, an adhesive in there. Once that's set and the whole thing is flattened, then you put the support, and that last, uh, the third slide in from the left, shows uh, individual canvas fibers laid across with adhesive. So that's minimal support, but enough support that uh, you won't see that uh, mirror image on the surface. It's, it's a lot more tedious than a patch, but it solves that problem. Ah, so lining canvases is, um, I alluded to it a few moments ago. Um, it's not really showing very much, but uh, the, the chart that I, I found uh, from the uh, Rijksmuseum, uh, skin glue, this is the basic components of, of the traditional glue. Uh, flour, I guess, for bulking, you know, if you're dealing with canvas to canvas, um, and water. Additives, vinegar, honey, molasses, sugar, these are all things that have been deciphered from older lining uh, recipe books. and uh, Syrup, um, disinfectant, garlic, I've re actually read about that. Uh, there's other, uh, that was used in the 19th and early 20th century. Uh, other components, beer, mucilages, linen grain, gracila, linseed oil. People have these proprietary recipes for these uh, linings. Um, and uh, yeah, anyway, that's glue linings. I didn't have a picture of the old fashioned irons, but there's somebody doing a contemporary glue lining. And if it's done carefully, it can be done uh, uh, successfully without necessarily um, uh, flattening impasto. And not every painting has impasto, so it's case by case. I've seen some very beautiful uh, glue linings. Our studio doesn't do glue linings. We use a, uh, uh, an adhesive called Beva 371, which is a uh, you, some of you may know it. Um, yeah, it's actually quite good. It's very low heat set point. It was developed by a conservator for just this reason. Uh, on the right, I just threw that in because I thought that was a very neat thing. See the, the gentleman with the roller? That roller has hot water in it. So it's a heated roller for uh, flattening out whatever it is they're working on over there. I've not seen that one before. Um, oh, I should say, um, so that's the, the left is the paste and, and the majority of linings throughout history have been that. In uh, the 19th and 20th century, you see a lot of wax and resin. 
as a sort of a, a sort of a gentler adhesive, but the problem with wax resin linings is A, they don't hold very well over time. You'll see cracks, you know, flattened paint layers starting to curl up again with a wax lining. And B, they the wax migrates into the canvas and can darken. So you'll see uh yeah, a discoloration or a deadening of a, a very light, thinly painted painting. We, we it, it's it's routine now to reverse wax lining. We we have ways of leaching out, taking them off and leaching them out, and using uh, what we use is the the Beva 371, um, which is much uh, much stronger and much more uh, agreeable. Uh, the big, the big trick, the big innovation of the 20th century is the vacuum hot table. So instead of just sort of lining one canvas to another and ironing them together, you can control it with a table uh, where you can control the heat, control the temperature, uh, obviously control the duration of the heat, um, and you can also control uh, suction. It's it's like shrink wrapping, just about. Uh, you see the slide on the right. There's um, it's not as clear as I had hoped, but there's a, uh, a sheet of mylar across the painting, and those two things coming onto, but next to the painting onto the surface, those are suck uh, hoses to carry the suction, uh, the air suction, uh, down to a, uh, a vacuum. Um, and leads are basically holes are cut in the plastic, so it literally, literally just sucks everything flat. You can control the level of suction, so no irons are needed. Uh, that's the great innovation: is the vacuum hot table. Um, you can control the time, temperature. Uh, yeah, I mean the duration and the temperature and the level of suction. Um, and there's no need to to uh, to you know, use these sort of brutal hot irons anymore. Um, uh, and that's what we use at our studio. Um, the, 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 the one to the left is sort of a, a one that, an early one that uh, uh, is very elaborate and has the, the vacuum built into it. Uh, quite often the uh, tables now are just a, an aluminum top that has a heating element underneath it uh, that you can control, and then a, a separate vacuum and these pumps, these leads that come up to the uh, sandwich, as we call it, to the top canvas. It's not just another canvas behind it. We use an interleaf of mylar between the two, which really holds, it gives the crack something to hold down to. Uh, and there's even another layer which helps with removal. So the whole thing can be a little bit thick, um, but it's very sturdy and it's very reversible. Um, oh, and sometimes these tables are used uh, to relax paint films. No lining is necessary, but it's put on, the canvas is removed from the stretcher and put on the table literally to settle down some cracks um, and, uh, um, and then it's restretched. They, they will come back somewhat, but um, we, can, we can introduce adhesives into that. Uh, panels often require um, jigs that are custom to Whatever the problem is, uh, they will warp and split. Um, so once the two pieces are brought back into plane and glue is put in, it has to be, we, we make custom jigs to kind of set, set those things uh, properly. Um, you've all seen cradles before on older pictures. It looks sort of uh, like a, a, a very interesting lattice work, but um, it's, I, I found them, fascinating when I first learned about what they actually do. Uh, cradling uh, is a reinforcement on the back of a warped panel. Um, it's, it's still done today by, by certain uh, specialists, um, but I, I should describe that not all of these uh, lattices are uh, glued to the panel. Um, using the middle one as an example, the grain runs vertically, the panel will uh, warp sort of like this, concave if you're looking at the back. Because the, uh, the wood is exposed over time, it dries out, it responds to, it's hygroscopic, it responds to uh, moisture in the atmosphere. And ultimately, the, 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 the wood uh, will dry out and shrink more on the back than on the front, which is covered with all the layers of the paint. So it will cup like this, curl, you've seen it a million times in museums, 
In order to counteract that, um, it was devised that the panel would be shaved down to a much thinner level. It's already risky. These strips would be glued along the grain line. They are glued to the panel um, at regular intervals, although not always regular. Um, slots are cut to accommodate these horizontal uh, pieces of wood. They are not glued. They can literally run freely in and out, but they don't because of this uh, warping. The idea is that it will hold it more or less flat, and, but if the panel needs to expand and contract, it will be able to do so accordion-like, freely moving along the, the, uh, the horizontal axis in that case. Uh, brilliant idea, but they often lock up. You know, the, uh, the panel also wants to warp back into its original shape, uh, and the thing locks up, and sometimes they can cause problems. The wood still needs to go somewhere. It wants to move, and it comes out on the surface. So I've seen pictures where they're cradled in order to solve a problem, but it now creates uh, a tension that uh, the paint film can't handle, and you'll see cracking on the surface uh, in response to its not being able to move. It doesn't happen often. Usually they, they work pretty well to keep it more or less flat. But it's, as you can tell just from my description, it's a very involved process. Um, mechanical removal of foreign paint matter. So that's, we use a lot of um, scalpels in our work. Uh, uh, if we don't need chemicals, and this, is a, this was about a month ago, uh, this picture here had a blob of overpaint. You can even see it's discolored, everything I told you earlier. You can see how it's discolored. It probably matched a little bit better. It might have had resin in it, but this painting isn't even that old. It's probably 1870s, 1880s. Um, but it discolored. It's easy enough to take a sharp scalpel and uh, pick it off, literally pick off the overpaint. And um, it doesn't endanger the rest of the uh, picture because we're not using any kind of solvent to do that. And reds are very susceptible to solvents quite often because of their chemical makeup, so reds and browns. So uh, in that case, we chose to get rid of it with the scalpel. You can see the cleaned up version. This, um, this big blob was there to address two little holes. It could have been done much better. So I filled the holes and then re retouched it. Excuse me, oh, that's another project uh, I was working on. On the left, you see, this is how it came to me. It was filthy. Uh, there was a big yellowed um, kind of welt in his forehead. When I cleaned it, I realized it was all over paint, and it was a hole, a pretty substantial hole that had a piece of wrongly calibrated canvas stuck in there, so they, anyway, they thought they were doing something fancy, but it was a, it was, it was a mess. So cleaned that with a scalpel, and then filled it, and then the last slide is just the beginning of retouching. Uh, and there he is now. Um, he did actually a little bit more retouching after that, but um, um, we often find a lot of dirt and debris behind canvases, I just thought I'd show. Uh, we we've, we've found uh, bugs, um, webs, uh, screws, keys that come loose and slot down. They can, they can make for big kind of, uh, you know, bulges on the surface and sometimes cracking just from being there for so long. So um, especially when a canvas is removed, there's a, usually a lot to clean. And you see the woman on the, uh, on the right using vacuum, getting underneath, trying to clean that stuff out. Um, cleaning itself, uh, dry cleaning, if you can get away with the dry cleaning, no, no detergents or solvents, then uh, uh, that's much better. By dry cleaning, we use these eraser bags. Uh, do any of you use them in your drawing? Uh, they're an artist's tool as well as a conservator's tool. These bag is filled with eraser shavings. Um, it's a cloth bag, it's a bit stretchy. Sometimes you can um, sort of uh, rock and roll the bag a little bit between your hands and the eraser shavings come out. 
And then uh, when I worked in a paper lab, that was a technique for cleaning surface, uh, surface soot. You just roll the eraser shavings with your clean fingertips across the surface, and it picks up a lot of dirt. No, no danger to the piece, obviously, uh, unless, uh, you know, there's something coming up or it's fragile, but, um, but it, it picks dirt up and out without using any solvents or any, uh, anything liquid. Um, there's a whole variety of sponges now, cellulose sponges, uh, that people use for, for cleaning artworks, especially a lot of um, contemporary, modern, 20th century pieces, which don't have the traditional layering structure of old paintings with varnish. These are very useful. Um, and then the standard old brush for getting rid of uh, just loose dirt. Uh, very wisely, people do not want to touch their pain, paintings, even though that's sometimes all it takes. It's just a good brushing. Um, wet cleaning. Uh, I show this slide because it was the only one I could find online of somebody using a stopping swab. Um, I've been doing this for a lot of years, and I, I, I almost never see people uh, cleaning with one hand with the swab and the other hand with the stopping agent or something to halt the, uh, the, the cutting power of their swab. Uh, this woman's doing it right, although I don't love the use of forceps, but some people use forceps um, uh, uh, because it could possibly abrade the painting, but still, she's got a stopping swab, a neutral solvent in the left hand if her acetone, alcohol, whatever solvent mixture she's using is working a little too aggressively or in a certain area, she, she can stop it instantly by flooding it with thinners. Um, and that's the proper way. Uh, oh, this. Yes, I, I, did any of you see this online? Yeah, this was a bit controversial. Um, and the world's restorers uh, uh, complained when um, the Philip Mould Gallery, British old master dealers, uh, posted this. Look, look what our restorers finding this beautiful uh, portrait from uh, the uh, 16th century cleans but they did it for that Instagram love, and honestly, they got a lot of hits, but they also got a lot of complaints from serious conservators, like, you don't clean like this. Obviously, it's sped up, but with, with, with goo dripping down and just uncontrolled, like, from one part of the uh, area to the other, yeah, that, that's wrong. <laughs> so um, they very, the internet spoke out, which was good. Um, it's not worth the likes. Anyway, it's a beautiful picture, and it's probably safe, but uh, there's no stopping swab in sight, and they, they just uh, uh, did it for the very dramatic image. Um, so wet cleaning, uh, we used uh, water-based to start for the surface soot, um, soaps, detergents, ammonias, various additives to kind of remove any kind of soot soil. Uh, then we'll clean, because that sits, would sit on top of a yellowed varnish, uh, then we'll clean off the varnish. These varnishes were meant to be changed. Remember, Chinino, they, they've known for forever that varnish, natural resins will yellow. Um, uh, and quite often, we'll have to go back with detergents underneath once that varnish is removed because there's dirt. It was varnished on top of house dirt. You all know that you're supposed to wait about six months to a year till your painting's fully dry before you varnish, yeah? Well, um, a lot of dirt can accumulate in that time, especially in the 19th century and previous centuries where, uh, where there might be soot in the air, there might be candle smoke, oil smoke, um, then the painting is varnished, so we'll often find a layer of dirt yet again underneath the varnish. And it's always fun and a miracle when you, when you do that second level of detergent cleaning and even more comes up. Oh, um, acetone alcohol, you've all heard of. Xylene, very nasty smelling. Toluene, uh, um, I have some over there. Uh, that, that, that's a solvent that we, I use for retouching. Like, it, it evaporates very quickly. It's very stinky. It's not good for you, but um, it, it, uh, it, does, it solves our colors very well. And dimethylformamide is one of many, they, these are carcinogens, we use them as infrequently as we can get away with, but that will, that's, that's one of a class of solvents that will actually remove dried oil paint after it's polymerized. It can burn through the nasty stuff. Um, 
obviously you have to be very careful when using it if there's some very stubborn overpaint. Uh, there's some people that very rightly, I, underst I, I understand where they're coming from, they don't wanna use it at all, it's not worth the health risks and the danger. If it's used properly um, in uh, a gel or a poultice and very specifically for a very specific overpaint, it, it's got its uses. Um, and there are other things that fall into that category too. Um, just some examples of what we encounter, overpaint and discolored varnish masking surface damage, uh, likely caused by previously overzealous cleaning. Uh, so you'll see in the left-hand slide, um, it's very, um, it's yellowed, of course, up to where it's cleaned, but all, all of that, um, all of those uh, uh, losses and brown spots uh, our abrasion, and that's that was buried under probably a, an earlier uh, restorer's work where they cleaned too far, and unfortunately they covered their tracks by overpainting with a glaze. It's not uncommon, unfortunately. And uh, we have to make the choice whether to uncover that. The clients don't always wanna know, but you know, if you're dealing with sophisticated people, they, they understand that this is a, a possibility and you're gonna do it right with tiny dots. And they would rather get to that place where the original skin tones are visible. So that's, um, yeah, I put her name up. She's a wonderful restorer and she gave me permission to use. A lot of these slides are from uh, her site because she happens to uh, have some very descriptive uh, images showing the processes. That's um, Maureen Andrew. She's a, a French woman living in London, living and working in London now. Um, natural resins yellow, this was well known uh, uh, and uh, and even some of the varnishes that we use, the synthetic varnishes, depending on what solvents they're, they're, they're made with, they'll yellow as well. They're meant to be temporary, although uh, many artists and restorers decry the fact that there's no perfect varnish. Um, a perfect varnish would just stay, never sink in, and never yellow. Glass, it doesn't happen, so um, hence the waiting time, why you should wait, because if you, if you varnish your picture too soon, and many artists are guilty of this. If you varnish a picture too soon, the varnish tends to migrate into the paint layer, and then when it eventually yellows somewhat and a restorer comes to it, uh, you could risk removing those top layers if the varnish has migrated down to that level. So by letting the painting fully dry, you're creating a, 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 a Oh, almost a, 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 a barrier by, a by if not a barrier, but uh, just a harder surface um, for the, 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 the varnish to not migrate into. Yeah? Is, is there a length of time or somewhere to verify that it's exactly the rule of the rule of thumb is six months to a year. Um, and all the old things that they've known for centuries, if you, if you put your paintings literally in the sun to expose them to uh, basically the sun's ultraviolet, that helps the, uh, the polymerization, the curing of oil paint. If you paint with a lot of resin, this resinous medium that has been pushed for, I don't know, 50 years, whatever, a Damar medium, Damar is a soft resin, all bets are off. If you use straight up oil and you paint relatively thin, maybe it's a little sooner. Um, uh, Gamvar, which I'm sure all of you, that's sort of, a, Gamvar is having a moment right now. Uh, everybody's using it. Um, it is actually based on a very well regarded conservator's varnish, Regal Res. It's, the, it's, a, it's a very low molecular weight resin that gives a very quick gloss and it's very easily removable. Um, they advertise that you can just, this is the varnish you can put on right away. I'm not so sure they should be saying that, but then again, um, uh, Gamblin's a good company, so uh, I'm sure there is some science behind that. Uh, uh, it's always better to let your painting dry as long as you can before varnishing it. Well, as I said, the varnish can then migrate into the paint layer and then make a future cleaning. It's all theoretical. It's not. It's not going to damage it necessarily. Um, but it, it, you know, uh, this has been artist's advice for uh, for centuries. 
um, because you know the properties of oil don't change. Uh, it still takes a long time. You can use artificial dryers, you can put it in the sun, those things, all those things help the oil set up more quickly. But uh, but yeah, you should you should give a little bit of time. It can be. Um, in fact, we started experimenting with it. We we prefer Solivar. It's a sturdier varnish. It's a different kind of resin. Um, Liquitex makes Solivar, uh, and it tends to be a good all-around varnish. But um, Gam and Gamvar is very soft varnish. So working on top of it then, as an isolating varnish for a restore. It can be a little tricky because of the type of re uh, resin it is. Um, it can leave palm prints, thumb prints, that kind of thing. Um, but it is, yes, it can absolutely be used as, are you asking as a painter or me as a restorer? As a restorer, yes, it can be. As a painter, um, I mean, I could go on about like interim varnishes. I do it all the time, but it's not always so kosher in your in your painting to like varnish in between because you risk when you put that oil layer on top of it again, some kind of deterioration or or damage when when being cleaned later. Um, I yeah. Have you heard about the, like speeding up the process? I've not heard about baking it, <laughs> no. Um, I know that uh, Von Megren, the guy who fakes the uh, Vermeers, did use, he used phenol formaldehyde in his medium and he baked it, I guess to get a brittleness and then he'd run it over the edge of a table to get cracks. Uh, I'm not sure that's not what you're talking about, but I've never heard that well, I shouldn't say that. There was a good book on forgery, this, um, I'm, oh, uh, Car not carpe diem, it's another Latin phrase. Uh, oh, it's escaping me right now. This is a great book by this forger who just came clean. He's living in Florida now, but I think he did. He might have actually uh, heated his paintings. But again, to sort of like simulate aging, and um, uh, that's a trick that certain frame makers do to simulate like a 13th century like altarpiece. They'll add, um, uh, what do you, what's the stuff you add with cooking? Um, Cornstarch, cornstarch, corn in with the gesso, they'll make gesso, but they'll component it as cornstarch, and uh, then they'll heat it with a hot air guns on their sort of faux 13th century altarpiece after they've gilded it, and it, it desiccates instantly, centuries of age, and then they'll rub color into it. It's, it's very effective, actually. Um, but that's fakery, that's not, uh, you're asking as a painter, yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't bake your paintings. Yeah, the, I, I do, I use it all, and I, I sort of don't care about my own paintings, I'm telling you what you should do, but um, uh, uh, for me it's just one big experiment, you know, and so far they nothing's fallen apart, but um, oiling out, um, oh, there's a great article, a great article on, um, on Natural uh, Pigments website, um, he published it, do you guys get his newsletter, George O'Hanlon's? A great article by James Robinson, I want to say, um, from Minneapolis on the history of oiling out and the science behind it and historical examples. And I, I urge you all to, to look at that. Um, it's going to be a five-part series, but the first part could stand on its own. So just go to, go to the Natural Pigments website. Um, oiling out is a time-honored thing. Uh, I, you know, I did it with poppy oil for a while. Just as long as you put it on and then take it off just very thin, you shouldn't get into too much trouble. Some people say never, never, but yeah. you have to see what you're painting into. Exactly. Paint loves paint, right? Um, so this is just illustrating um, how the varnish affects certain colors other than, uh, certain colors more than others. Um, and you can see how uh, the the brown of, of uh, let's see, little shadow here is probably not nearly as affected as that beautiful blue sky. So one of the previous uh, head conservators at the Metropolitan Museum, John Brealey, uh, was a very thoughtful, brilliant guy. He was, I think, the 70s into the 80s, maybe. Um, and he had this concept of partial cleaning, or ba basically sensitive cleaning, where you should really pay attention to what 
what was the artist's intention? Don't just use one solvent and clean the whole thing and just think about, do I need to take the varnish off so much here? It's really affecting those colors up there. Um, he would do uh, in, uh, partial cleanings, or, but, but very thoughtfully. Uh, you can see how you might mistake that for a dusk scene, uh, the, the one on the right up top. Uh, it's actually much brighter than that. This painting may in fact be even over cleaned, I don't know. Um, and this isn't one of Marine's paintings, but you know, this is just an example. People are very eager to share online and I'm not sure they always should. Um, uh, the, uh, you see how the clouds still retain that sort of yellowish golden hue up in the upper part, but they're very kind of blue and raw. I think that might be an example of slightly overcleaning. If this was my project, I might have backed off on the sky a little bit. Uh, I, I clearly, I believe in uh, uh, the, the brilliant idea of being very cautious and sensitive to where you're cleaning. Um, uh, and, and that you might, if you're a painter and you understand glazes and scumbles, you might actually be removing some of that fine work. This is, this is not, an, not an outrageous observation of mine. This is long known that restorers have damaged work by taking off the most subtle glazes by going a little too far. Better to leave a little patina. Uh, the isolating varnish I described as before, you see the, um, uh, 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 she's putting on the left after it's cleaned, a brush coat. A brush coat saturates. You all probably brush your own paintings. Um, it's the best way to do it. A lot of people, strangely, are, are, are afraid of varnishing. It's not that difficult, but you do need a dust-free environment, um, and you need to uh, uh, just not overbrush these things or not use too much varnish. Um, there's, there's a little bit of an art and technique to it, but not a lot. You, you could all do it easily. Um, that's the isolating coat, and you see working on the Vermeer over there, um, you're not actually painting on top of the painting. Um, you're painting on top of a varnish, presumably a conservator's varnish, very easy to uh, remove with very uh, um, uh, uh, mild solvents. That's, that's the thought these days. So anything we can do can be removed, A, because the color itself won't set up, and B, because it's got this slip of varnish it's on top of. Um, also, being on top of a varnish, it acts like a retouch varnish. You can see the colors you're trying to match. So uh, it gets a little tricky with um, unvarnished paintings. There's a lot of paintings that don't want to be varnished, that were never intended to be varnished, a lot of 20th century pictures. We still have to retouch those. Obviously, we can't use this uh, barrier, um, but we have to be very concise with our work and have the, the paints removable. Um, uh, just uh, this, I, I already went through this. Gamvar is a very popular varnish right now. Um, Regal Res, that's Regal Res in its crystal form. Conservators have been using it for several years and uh, mixing it up in the studio with solvents and uh, often um, UV inhibitors are added, not in that sort of a criminal way that I mentioned before, but just as a, uh, uh, a way to protect colors. Uh, the, uh, I tend not to add UV inhibitors because they only last a few years and then they sort of wear out. So um, the additive to the varnish is not necessarily doing it. And also most of the paintings we work on, the color is already faded if it's going to fade. Um, filling and texturing. Um, um, Motostuck is, do you know DAP, if you're filling a hole in the wall, the stuff they sell in hardware store? It's basically an Italian version of DAP, but a bit of a vogue among certain conservators. I use it. It's uh, from Italy. It works a little bit better. It's a little bit easier to carve. And um, basically, you want to overfill the lost area. And you see, this is uh, Marine's hand here. She's using a cork, and I've brought my cork there. It's very old school to use a cork. But once it's set up, once it's dry, this uh, putty or gesso, this modestook, um, you take a cork and wet it with a little bit of uh, wet paper towel or cotton that's with water on it, and just in a circular motion go on the top of it and it just levels it out to the level of the painting. Let it dry a bit more and then clean up the edges, clean up the excess. Then you have a nice level surface and then you can cut texture in with a scalpel. Um, and this is pretty brilliant on the right. That's prior to in-painting, all the work that's gone on to simulate the canvas texture. 
Uh, if, if it was dead flat, your colors could be perfect, but it will still stand out like a sore thumb. So um, uh, very few of us are good enough to get both the colors perfect and the texture, but uh, I like to put a lot of emphasis on the texture, uh, at least, because um, that's a big part of it. Um, retouching, uh, there's the UV image again of the picture on the left. You can see all the retouching that exists on that picture, but you wouldn't see it with your naked eye because the colors are matched. But under UV, the new material stands out as dark spots. Uh, I can tell often. Um, in the Louvre, they're, they go with a lot of old, funky restoration that just doesn't look so good, and you can just see it, you know. Um, they don't correct a lot of that stuff. Um, there's a lot of, I, I alluded to this before, and I don't want to go on about this, but there's a lot of not very good retouching in institutions because of the system and how people are trained up in this country. Um, you don't get to work on a lot of pictures, so sometimes people in very high levels are not very good retouchers, and you'll see it in museums. And there's also some very good work too. It's just whoever. But uh, um, I can see it sometimes. I go to pick to museums and I look on an angle. I can't help it. It's sort of an occupational hazard. Um, um, I was going to say something else about that. Oh, the Italian method of trattegio. The uh, Italians have this method. Uh, not everyone does it anymore, but you'll see in a lot of older, especially. Uh, historical, like archival, uh, me medieval things, or where there's a lot of loss. Instead of retouching the uh, actual, to, to blend it in the way the artist, the restorer on the um, uh, left did, they will let their restorations be visible by doing a, a sort of a cross hatching. So the salmon-colored uh, flesh there would be a little red, a little yellowy white, and when you, step, when you step back, it all blends together. Especially this works well for wall paintings. Sometimes they leave it as a general color, sometimes they modulate it a little bit, but they want it to be seen. I don't particularly like that. It calls attention to itself. I, I, I'm very nearsighted. I like to go up to pictures and look at their surface. I don't, I don't like seeing that, and it's not much in vogue, but there, there are people who do do that. I remember being at the UPC and seeing mm -hmm. Andrea Del Sarto's in particular. Yeah. A huge attention of the it's kind of an overreaction to the previous damage that I started talking about earlier. Um, like we're not so, we're not gonna try to hide anything. This is what we're doing and, uh, and you must see that this is lost. I'm like, I, I get it, but you know, I'd rather read about it in a card next to the painting that this area has some damage to it. I'm sometimes surprised at the Met, where this one is heavily restored, and I'll look at it and I can't see. So I understand why people do that, but it, it, to me, that that gets rid of the reason for looking at a picture. You know, if it's so, you know, so damaged, and they're they're celebrating the damage. That's my messy palette on the right, um, and you'll see we work very different than you guys work. Uh, the colors are very sticky. We use small little bits. We'll mix up a sort of a local base color, and then modulate that. Oh, it needs to be a little cooler here, and we can do that with those little dots. So instead of nailing one color uh, at the surface of a painting, will there's often like back and forth little dots dashes. And um, and it, and it it tends to uh, it tends to uh, blend all together. Um, the colors on the left, it's an Italian company, uh, My Mary. They make these are these have been discontinued. That's my own personal stash from home. Um, but uh, they make an other line of colors that are very popular. These are uh, these here are in a ketone resin, which is a synthetic resin. Uh, the the other ones that they have are in gums. Uh, there's no oil in them. There are gums and um, uh, various balsams and this and that, things that hold their color. They're very popular, very dense, they're very sticky. Uh, some people use just pure dry pigment, and then they will take a touch of the conservator's varnish on the tip of their brush and mix up, which is a perfectly valid way to do it too. You can also control the, um, the uh, uh, sheen of the color that way. Yes? It dries almost instantly. In fact, I can wrap this up and show you my palette. I brought it with the toluene. You have a few seconds to work, 
a few seconds. So you're back and forth. You get into a rhythm and you know that messy palette that I showed you. Uh, um, it's it's actually a very active place. You know, you're just back and forth. Are yeah. Those, yes. No, that because what, the, some people do retouch in watercolors, but um, uh, I don't find that useful or necessary. Um, uh, uh, these are these solve these are um, synthetic resins. Uh, the, the ones that I showed you with the red tubes, synthetic resins, or the natural resins, the other ones, they're in black tubes, the My Mary set. There's various retouching uh, uh, colors that people use, including on the right, those dry pigments. With a lot of, I, I have to do a job at uh, Sotheby's, uh, I think next week. Uh, Robert, Indiana, it's white. Um, white on white, but it had been scratched, and I'm going to bring white, titanium white, and my palette, and I'm going to mix in a combination of restoration colors and the pigment to kind of hopefully, you know, get the sheen. It can't. It's an unvarnished picture, you know. It, it can't have any sheen. So, uh, and it's got to be super tiny dots. I'm not looking forward to that job. Um, this is a, a little example of. Um, that's the damage after it's been filled. Only certain areas were low and needed to be filled. That was um, a damage that's the original canvas, that yellowy bit. Uh, here's a bit of just putting the, um, you can see by the my mammoth fingertips there, how small the brush is. Uh, so we use these tiny brushes, we just lay in a base color. Um, uh, it's very meditative work. Um, and on the right, you see uh, those green uh, um, laurel leaves have been added on top of that. So, you know, we just sort of recreate the area as needed. Um, where are we? Okay. Um, here's another one. Uh, you see the massive damage on this portrait, and uh, the lighter colors are much harder to match, as you can imagine, because there's no room for error. That's why the white is terrifying me so much. But um, whoops, oh, what happened there? Yeah. Again, uh, try to get a base color. Once it's all based out, then you go back in with tinier dots of the little bits of dirt that are elsewhere on the canvas. Every bit of information you need for retouching is right on either side of your damaged area. So you can you 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 can match it from that. Yes. How do you find um, on that one, I actually, it's what you guys would do, you know, you'd go to a source. I actually looked on, on that one. I rarely do this, but, because uh, I know anatomy pretty well, but, but ear anatomy is a little tricky. Um, you can see where the lines and the angles are going on that ear. Here, I could just show you with the cursor. You can see, that, you know, there's a line. I, I didn't include it, but I have some retouching shots of, of me basing the ear out. Um, you put a base color and then you pick out and you find the lines and like I say, all the information you need is just around it. So it's not creative at all. It should be very uh, clear by now. It's, it's, it's reconstructive um, and um, ideally should match. Um, so that's the base, but you see why there's this hard line here. We have to set a completely separate palette from the whites. I have to clean all my solvent cups. I have to clean my palette. And um, on this one, there's a pentiment of his shoulder, you know, where the, the angle was changed. I had to recreate even the pentiment to suggest, you know, to suggest it there. Uh, oh, let's do this. Uh, this was a beautiful, beautiful northern European one. Uh, very fine cracks. The panel had cracked, had been reinforced on the back. And the first slide shows the overfilling. I always go a little bit more. It's on top of the, the isolating varnish, so it's fine. Then I use my cork. On the second one, you can see, uh, oops, oops, didn't mean to do that. Uh, well, um, on the second one, you can see that's cleaned up. 
and then a coat of varnish is put on top of it to see exactly what you're uh, dealing with. And then the retouching, the very meditative retouching, uh, just hitting the, um, the the areas, just staying within within the cracks. Yes. We well, the acrylic is just a synthetic uh, base for a paint. Um, so yes, we do use acrylic some, at times. Um, uh, the we control the sheen if it has to be more matte than the paint that comes out of these conservation colored tubes, then we'll add dry pigment. Literally, just that. Um, there's other tricks. There's way of scuffing up the surface. There's ways of um, uh, uh, PVA and water makes a dead matte, you know, sometimes dots on top. Um, there's ways of doing it. Anyway, that's the finished version on the right. That was a joy to work on because that was very challenging. Top to bottom about, uh, I don't know, about 14 inches, 15 inches. Um, yeah, we, as you can tell, we, we, we see a lot of different things at our studio, which is pretty great. Uh, final varnishing, uh, the theory behind spraying the final varnish is that, um, and actually the slide on the left is a bit wrong, by the way, because that's not a final varnish that clearly has it. He's doing, an in, he's doing the isolating coat, most likely, um, uh, because it's not finished. Um, but uh, we like to brush the first coat, the isolating coat on, because you really want to saturate it. You want to simulate what it looked like prior. The sprayer can be good. Those are very professional sprayers, the top loaders, very fine mist. Um, but there's no substitute for a brushed on coat. Um, the, the fellow on the right is at the Brooklyn Museum and I do this every day at uh, 4.30 to 5 o'clock, whatever the day's catch is, whatever we've finished retouching, I'm the guy in the mask spraying, um, putting a final coat on, on things. Uh, the final coat being sprayed is so that uh, uh, you don't move your retouching, which is soft colors, which I mentioned before. So you want to spray that final coat, uh, which seals it. It evens out the gloss or the sheen if it needs to. And it also can be a corrective. Mm, your, your isolating coat was a little too glossy. The client wants this a bit more mute. Or some dealers, they want it to pop. They want glossier, glossier. So you take your best guess, but we have a lot of input from uh, our, our, our clients. Um, and, and that last varnishing is the chance I have to kind of you know, bat and clean up to like, you know, literally clean it up. Um, oh, these are just some general books that I read long ago. Um, I, some of you may be familiar with them. They're in Dover reprints. And again, I, I'm, I'm pre-internet guy, you know, all of this stuff's probably available on internet uh, archive. But um, these, are, these are good overviews of, of historic materials at processes, if you have any interest in, in how paintings were put together over the centuries. Uh, I think the Painter's Workshop has got the good chapter on conservation. It's from the 50s, it's ancient by today's standards, but it still reads well and it still uh, describes, you know, cracking and, and, and issues with, uh, you know, common issues with paintings. Um, the Painter's, I know the Painter's Methods and Materials by Lowry is online. Um, I have a bunch of these sitting on my phone anyway. Um, oh, that's our holiday card. That's where I work. That's the good people at Simon Parks. Recognize the painting? We staged it. Yeah, that's our holiday card. Uh, that's me off to the right. And that's our, our fearless leader, Simon, with, uh, with added, uh, added sideburns. Uh, he's holding a scalpel, and we're operating on a painting. It's very hokey. Yes, we are. Uh, we even have the uh, Joyce is reacting in horror to the left, and we have John taking notes in the back. Yeah, that was fun. Um, and uh, that's me. If anybody wants to uh, nerd out about uh, materials, I love it. Just <laughs> call, uh, you know, email me and uh, start a conversation. And that's it. <laughs>